of our web pages. And <clears throat> I just want to kind of go back and revisit and hit the major steps. Again, please refer to the documents on ANGEL for, for some more specifics about what the expectations are. Um, keep in mind in this process, we start very vague, very conceptual. And then we kind of funnel down into the actual physical appearance of the site. We don't start by making the site or making a page in the site or anything like that. We start by, first of all, making sure that we really understand what our goals are. If you think of any sort of communication, whether it be public speaking or writing a term paper, or anything like that. You want to know a few things. You want to know who your audience is, and you want to know what it is that you're trying to say, what your goals are. And you also want to know the goals of the people that are coming to, to hear you. All right, And you want to make sure that you address their goals as well as addressing your own goals. So the first part, the strategy part, is about Defining audience and defining goals. As far as defining audience, we have those personas that we talked about, where we actually make up fictional people that are representative of the people that we expect to be visiting our site. And we talk about you know, what their preferences are, what they're looking for, and so on. We then define a set of goals, both for ourselves and for uh, those, uh, th those personas, those people that are going to be visiting our site. Now keep in mind a couple things about these goals. The more specific you can make them, the better. The best goals are goals that you can actually measure. You know, We want to increase our sales by 15% after introducing this website. That's a great goal because you can look at and say, hey, you know, it was our sales were this much before the website, it's this much after the website. Did we achieve that goal or not? Unfortunately, not all goals can be expressed that concretely and, and, and that specifically. So as such, you know, sometimes the goals have to be a little less tangible. Um, the um, other thing to remember is the goal should relate to the content on your site and not simply be restatement of basic web design principles. So it's not a goal to say that you're going to have good navigation, right? Because that's just a basic web design principle. You know, nearly all websites ought to have a good and well-defined navigation. So that's not something that's a specific goal to your site. Or put differently, people are not visiting your site to, be, to view your navigation, all right? So think about it in those terms. Or, have a pleasant color combination. People aren't viewing your site simply to see some nice colors. All right. So when you define your goals, think in terms of what people are trying to get out of your site and what you are trying to get out of the site. You're not building a website just so that you can show off your navigation creation skills. You're, you're building it to achieve some other kind of business goal. So that's the goals. Second. The requirements. And that's where we get more specific and we say what we are going to put on the site to help us achieve those goals. Any goal that we think of, we can probably think of a bunch of different ways to get there. All right. And we have to decide what is the best way to achieve our goals from amongst all the options. A few things to keep in mind. You might say, well, if we have a few options, why not we put all of them on the site? Well, in some cases you might be able to do that, but you do want to be concerned about clutter. And you do want to be concerned that any additional stuff that you put on a site has the potential to distract people from the real important stuff on the site. So, you know. 
in so many respects, I, I talk about avoiding the all-you-can-eat mentality, where if I have an opportunity to do everything, I'm going to do everything I possibly can. You know, Discretion is better in, in picking what is going to maximize the effect of your website, as opposed to just throwing a bunch of stuff at people and saying, well, gee, if 10 pages are good, then 50 pages will be excellent. It doesn't work that way. All right. The requirements and the goals have a relationship. It's not a one-to-one -one relationship, but requirements should address at least one of your goals. All right. If you're putting on your site, you're putting on a site for a reason. Well, that reason better relate to one of your goals. <laughs> Otherwise, maybe it's not important. All right. Maybe it's not important to have that piece of content on your site. You know, if it doesn't uh, relate to one of the goals. By the same token, if you've defined something as one of your most important goals, then you better have something on the site that addresses it. All right? if, if we want to make it easier for customers to return goods that they purchase that are defective, if we have absolutely nothing on our site that addresses that, well, we somehow missed the boat, and we need to go back and make sure. So every goal should have at least one requirement that corresponds to it. Every, require, every requirement should match up with at least one goal. Now, it could be that one requirement helps serve several goals, all right? Or one goal has several requirements that help achieve it. But that's okay, as long as you don't have the opposite situation, where you have a goal that's not addressed by a requirement, or a requirement that really isn't attached to a goal. So, our goals. The specific content that's going to be on the site the next step is structure, where we define what the site, what pages we're going to have on our site, and how those pages are going to be organized. Now, most of you for this class, because we have a small project, are going to be doing some kind of hierarchy, where you have a home page, and then you have pages off that home page. But some of you might have, then, off one of your pages, another couple of pages, and so on. So you draw this to sort of show the way your site's going to be structured and the way your site's going to be organized. Remember, one of the things that we want to be able to do is we can have a whole bunch of requirements. We want to make sure those requirements are easy to find. What are some things we can do to make sure the requirements are easy to find? Well, one thing that we can do all right, is organize those requirements well into pages. Have things broken down into logical sets of pages. All right. And then we can apply a good navigation. Good navigation isn't just about creating links that look a certain way. It's about actually thinking through the way your site ought to be structured and breaking up and defining the pages in a way that is reasonable and makes sense for people. The fourth step is to do the what they call the skeleton. And this is wireframes. Now, you won't necessarily have a wireframe for every individual page. In other words, one page, or I'm sorry, one wireframe you might have one wireframe for all of your pages. Or maybe you have two wireframes that cover all of your pages. A wireframe is just a basic sketch that says, hey, we have a banner up here. We're going to have the navigation over here. We're going to have our content here. And we're going to have a footer over here. All right? So all your pages on your whole site might look like that. Or maybe your home page looks one way and the rest of the pages look another way. Or maybe most of your pages look one way, but you have a photo gallery that looks a different way. All right? So it's not like you have one wireframe per page. You have one wireframe per different layout that your pages can take. All right? Then the last step is the prototype. And the prototype is where you actually make sort of rough draft versions of your web pages. All right. 
You don't want to make, you don't want to, you don't want to create a final product. You don't want to go to all the trouble to create a absolutely polished and perfect prototype. Why do I say that? Why don't you want to go to all the trouble to make a, a perfect prototype? She isn't being perfect nice, you know, <laughs> is that what we aim for? You spend too much time, and, and what's the downside of spending too much time? Or, or let me put it this way. Why for a prototype is it not spending too much time a good thing? Compared to say the final product. Okay. One reason is, is again, and I, uh, um, the answer the student gave is, is something to the effect of that in the design phase you're in sort of a creative mode and you're, you're coming up with some ideas and all that. And to really go for perfection there isn't really the point of the prototype. Let's consider the purpose of the prototype. All right, the purpose of the prototype is to give people something tangible to look at. I mean, it's one thing to have the document with all the stuff in there. That, that people can get meaningful information from that. But people will oftentimes get a lot of meaningful information by sort of a working model of it. All right? So I could tell you what, I have a Scion XB. I could tell you what a Scion XB looks like if you've never seen one before. And I could, I could um, you know say that it's very boxy and it's low to the ground and this, that, and the other. But I have a model of a Scion XB upstairs all right, in, in my office. If I brought it down here, you looked at it, boom, instantly you know exactly what I'm talking about. All right? Now, that Scion XB model doesn't have an engine in it, all right? so it's not really a Scion XB. It's not a perfect model for it, but yet it gets the job done if it, what I want to do is explain what it looks like. Similar idea with a prototype. You don't want to spend too much time on it because you haven't come up with your final design yet. It's still subject to change. People may look at what you've done for your prototype and say, I don't like this. And in a way, you have to develop a bit of a thick skin, right? Because you present prototypes to be criticized, all right? That's the time to get the criticism out of your client system, right? In other words, don't show them a finished product that they hate, <laughs> all right, when it's already done. Show them a prototype, and they may rip it to shreds, all right? This is especially true if you have a client that doesn't necessarily, that, that's hard to communicate with, that, that doesn't necessarily, um, that, that you have a hard time drawing information out, you know? If you, not everyone can tell you what they want, but almost everyone can criticize something if you put it in front of them. So you take your best shot with your prototype, you put it in front of people, and, and by people I mean like the people you're developing the website for, and you let them criticize it. And if they like it, great. Then you go and you make it perfect. Then you finish everything out and, and flesh it out and, and make it work for real. If they don't like it, then yeah, you gotta go back to the drawing board, but at least you haven't completed the whole process. And if you remember on that curve that goes up for the cost of ma making a change, you're still on the lower end of the curve. So, uh, curve. so uh, making the changes and all that um, costly for the organization. All right, and at least you have your answers now. All right, so again, when you develop a prototype, you're, you're giving people something tangible to look at and criticize. I guess this goes back to why we even create this document in the first place. Why do we go, why do we even bother creating a design document like this that has all these parts? Because it's a fair amount of work, all right? And why do we do it? We do it for a couple reasons. First of all, anything that we do in life, all right, that's important, it's probably good to plan it, all right? Now, I know there's people that like to, you know, fly by the seat of their pants and just, you know, go out and do things and all that. 
and, and you know, more power to them if it works for them. But typically, no matter what you're talking about, if it's a big deal, it's probably best to plan it. All right? <laughs> and you can talk about, you know, in academic things, writing a term paper, you know, research paper. You better plan it. You better not just sit down at the, I was going to say the typewriter. Boy. Better not sit down at your keyboard and just start banging away, right? And you should think and you should outline it and you should do research and, and all that. If you are building a house, you're not just going to go in the middle of a field with wood and hammers and nails and start, you know, going at it. You know, if you're planning a party, you're going to give some thought to how many people do I want to invite, you know, and so on down the line. So anything we do, it's important to plan, especially for, for big things, for, for major undertakings. And developing a good website is a major undertaking. Um, if you don't think it's that hard, then how do you explain all the bad websites that exist in the world? All right? And I would argue that most sites that are bad aren't bad because the people didn't technically know what to do. It's because they didn't spend a lot of thought about it. They, they didn't design it. They just kind of winged it and you know you, you get those sort of results so one reason is the planning aspect it's important to plan something that's a big deal the second reason is to communicate with other people now what other people am I talking about I'm talking about first of all your client now when I say client it might be someone in your organization right I mean it might not be someone from the outside world or maybe if like you are a consultant it might be the person that hired you to build the website alright so whoever you're building the website for alright we'll, we'll call that your client well it's important for you to communicate to them what your plans are so you don't get a bad surprise when they're when you're done and you you deliver a site that just looks horrible and and doesn't do what they want it to do so by showing the prototype, you can catch problems, again, at the early end of the curve where it's easy to make the changes to them. The other thing is, is depending on the nature of the product uh, and, and, and your organization, you might be working with other software developers, you might be working with other web developers, and maybe each is responsible for a piece of it. Well, a design document is a nice way to get everyone on the same page and everyone know what it's going to look like, what it's going to act like, and, and so on. So we, de we developed this planning document to communicate and as, as part of the planning process. You know, a lot of times people say, you know, oh, I got the plans up here. Well, again, there's, there's two things wrong with that statement, all right? The first thing is, is people can't go in and read your mind and see what you think it's supposed to look like, all right? That's the one thing. And then the second thing is, is, I question if people really do have the plans. They may have a start of a plans. It's, it's like, you know, to, to give a very mundane example, it's like if I go grocery shopping and I haven't made a list, right? <laughs> and I, if I go grocery shopping and, and uh, uh, don't make a list, and I think, oh, I know what we need, right? Grocery shopping, how hard is that? I get the same thing every week. Well, yes, it gets the same thing every week until we get home and we look and it's like, oh, we forgot paper towels. Oh, we forgot this. Oh, we forgot that. Or the reverse side is true, too. Did I really need to buy these six frozen pizzas? <laughs> you know, they look they looked good, <laughs> you know, uh, but did I really need to buy those? Okay, uh, maybe not. So, again, we think we have it planned up here, but... I'm going to question that if people, people say that. And then we want to communicate to other people. Okay, so we've developed our design document and we've developed the prototype. What do we want to do then? We want to go and we want to make our site for real. All right? Or even, even we'll put it this way, how do you develop a prototype and, and how do you make the actual pages? Well, what I'm going to suggest is a process that looks like this. And we're going to use what we know and use the things that we have talked about before as far as making our pages easy to change. What we're going to do is we're going to first develop a template.
we're going to develop one template per wireframe. So maybe I say that some of my pages look like this, and maybe some of my pages look like this. For whatever reason, we'll, we'll, not, we'll not be concerned ourselves with the reason. Remember, you won't necessarily have one wireframe per page. You'll have one wireframe per set of pages, for pages that kind of have the same structure. So maybe I have two wireframes. I'm going to develop a template for each of those. All right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to develop an HTML document for each wireframe. I'm going to develop an HTML document that has the stuff in it, and then I'm going to develop a CSS file that styles it. And the CSS file is going to be responsible for everything about the appearance, so the colors, the fonts, and ultimately how it's laid out. Notice how I have this drawn laid out this way. That's something you can't do in HTML. You need the CSS to achieve that layout. And that's really probably what our next big topic is. All right, talking about CSS to lay it out. When I talk about a template, I talk about a pattern, right? That you that you can fill in with details. All right? So for example, if, if I was a, you know, if I am a, 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 a marketing company and I want to send out a letter advertising um, something, all right, I'm not writing a separate letter to every customer, right? Sit down at the keyboard, dear Mike Zellers, dear John Smith. Dear Mary Jones. That doesn't really make sense, right? What do I have? I have a form letter, all right? I have a letter where 99% of it's the same, right? And what do I fill in? I fill in the specific stuff for each instance of the letter. So, dear, and then I insert the name, Mike Zellers, on mine. So I don't change the whole letter each time. I change just the, the specific content. So when we develop our web page, template, web page template, we're doing much like that form letter. In other words, if we think about it, we develop a template. If we've said our wireframe is going to look like this, then probably this banner is going to be the same on every single page, right? Just like in our form letter, maybe the top of the form letter is the same on every single page. And the navigation is probably going to be the same on every single page, right? And the footer is going to be the same on every single page. So we put those things in a template file, all right? We put those things and we get those down exactly the way we want them to look to as great a degree as possible. Again, on the prototype, we would maybe be a little looser as far as that, not require perfection. In the final version, we're going to shoot for as, as good as we can possibly make it. A section of the page, then, is going to be different on each page. So. If I had an About Us page, this would have some content here about us. If I had a History of My Company page, there would be information there. If I had a New Products page, there'd be information about the new products. So in other words, these three sections are going to be the same on every page. This one section is going to be different. All right. And the one section that is different, all right, is going to be different on every page. And we sort of just put in a placeholder on the, on the, on the template, all right? 
The common content, though, the thing that's going to be the same on every page, we want to make sure we get that as good as possible and as correct as we possibly can. Why? Because after we've developed this template, we're going to clone it for each of the pages. That is, we're going to make copies of it. And after we've made copies of it, if we have to go back and change it, we have to change all the copies. All right? It would be like after they printed the form letter, they found out that they spelled something wrong. They'd have to go back and white out the, the wrong word or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know. Uh, if you go outside today, you'll see hitch to uh, hitch to uh, one of the, the the lighting posts, my horse and buggy. So yeah, uh, you know, and it's funny. It's like sometimes I make those jokes on purpose. Just but there, I didn't even think about that. Um, I think I do. I think I do. I think Michael Naismith's mom invented whiteout. Michael Naismith, one of the monkeys, who is coming to Loring Community College. Not, not an actual monkey, but the band, the monkeys, all right, is coming to, uh, yeah, yeah well, that, that's why I said that, yeah, exactly. That's right, uh, yeah. I, I, I was getting confused between the story between that and the sticky notes story. Because I guess sticky notes were, someone was trying to make a glue, and it didn't work. Because it, like, it, it didn't like really hold. But then someone said, hmm, that's actually kind of cool. Because if we don't want something to be stuck permanently, we can just use this stuff. And that's how that was. So I, 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 I was getting confused between the whiteout and the sticky note story. All right. Anyhow, so that's our aim. The CSS file is the one that we're actually a little less concerned about, right? We're a little less concerned about getting that perfect in the prototype. Why is that? Well, because we're probably only going to have one CSS file, or maybe two CSS files, if we have two different wireframes. And if we don't get that perfect, there's only one file to change. So changing that is easy. Changing the HTML is going to be hard. Changing the common content of the HTML is going to be hard, because we're going to have to change it in several places. Changing the common CSS is easy. So if they come back and they say that's too dark of a blue, I only have to change the, that color in one place. If, however, they say, gee, I want different information in the footer, then I have to go back and change all the cloned things. All right. So again, um, you do your best to get the HTML and the common content and the common structure as good as you can. It doesn't have to be perfect, but you do your best on that because that's harder to change once you've started cloning. The CSS, again, if, you develop, if you've used good standards for developing this, um, you, uh, you, know, you, you should only have to change it in one place. All right. I'm going to talk about the approach I would take then if I have to develop a template. All right. What I first would do is I would develop a skeleton HTML for this. Except I wouldn't be worried about the exact styling of it. All right? Because again, the HTML doesn't contain the style, right? The HTML just contains the content. What tags do you think I'm going to use for each of these sections? What tag am I going to use for the banner? Uh, yes, the header section. What am I going to use for the nav? Well, all of these are in the body, but what is going to be what? What is the nav going to be contained in? The nav tag, right? As a not a trick question, the footer is going to be in a footer tag. What is this different content area going to be? This is the one you actually have a couple choices of. Could be article, could be section, could be div. 
All right. So I'll probably make it an article. All right. But it could just as well. Oh, actually, I'll probably make it a section. All right. But it could be an article and it could be a div. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm first going to develop like the main blocks of the page. All right. And each of these purpose, each of these things serve a purpose, right? The navigation we've talked about to provide access to all the information on the site and it'll allow people a path to get to what they need. Footer information is kind of information of sort of secondary importance. All right. You think of the you you, you think of the footer as like maybe uh, uh, maybe there's like a, an email address of who to contact if you have problems or whatever. It's not to say it's not important, but it's not necessarily something you want right up in the person's face. What's the purpose of a banner on a web page? What does that do? Catches attention. What else does it do? It's a title. All right. Or it can be, yeah. It clearly identifies the site and gives a sense of like the purpose of the site. In other words, and again, this is one of those things that you might look and say, that's obvious. Why do I even need to talk about that? Well, it's obvious except for when people don't do it. And you look at the site and it's like, what is the site about then? You know, and I've seen many sites like that. But when I talk about the banner, I'm talking about something like this. Here's a banner. All right, actually, all of this is a banner, and really the nav sort of part of the banner. All right. I was doing so good, too. Oh, actually, I had it on the right thing. It's just that it didn't work. I don't feel so bad then. There we go. The banner. All right. In other words, you're not going to go to the site and say, gee, what is this site for? Is this site for Tri-C? Yeah, no, it's right there. It's right there. It's right up in your face, right? I mean, you can see that. And if we went to other sites, wow, Cleveland State. Again, no question about what the site is for. Um, Amazon. All right. All these things, you know, the banner identifies what the site is for and where you landed. And again, you know, that, that's one of those things that you take for granted except when people don't do a good job with it and then your users are confused. All right. Now, the other thing, the other point to make is that consistency in design is good. We talked a little bit about a visual language. All right. Therefore, I, even if I have a couple different wireframes, I'm going to want to keep my layout relatively consistent because that gives people sort of that nonverbal message that they're still on the same site. If I had a certain color scheme, then all of a sudden you clicked on a link and there was a radically different layout, a radically different color scheme and fonts, you're liable to think that you went to another site. And that would be disorienting or confusing to you. So, in terms of the banner, the navigation, and the layout, or, or the footer, and the, and the general layout, consistency is good. Consistency doesn't mean it needs to be identical on every page, but if it's different on a page or a set of pages, there should be a reason for it. All right. And it should still be relatively con consistent. For example, we go to Cleveland State's home page. That's their banner on their home page, right? If we go to one of their other pages, notice the banner isn't identical. But they kept this consistency here to sort of anchor you. It's in the exact same spot. So they don't have the words Cleveland State University written here as you go from other pages. 
but there's a little variance between that. But I don't think so much that it would confuse you. All right. It could be done in CSS or it could be done in JavaScript. You'd have to look at the exact code to see exactly how it's done. So what's our task for the next few days? Our task for the next few days is taking and creating this that we're going to clone and make a set of pages. So we're going to do a website for the Zellers organization, which I don't know what we do. Um, we we do photography. All right, that's, that's that's easy enough. I can maybe put some images up there, and so on. All right, so I'm going to go in, and I'm going to fire up our friend Notepad. I use Notepad again simply because I know it's available on all Windows machines. And, and therefore, you know, I'm not going to have someone say, well, you're, it was confusing because you're using this and I don't have that application and so on. You can use any simple text editor. For example, in the labs, there's Notepad++, which I think is available for free. And that's nice because that does some color coding and all that. Um, there's, there's, on the Mac, and I don't know if there's a Windows version for it, um, that is called uh, Text Wrangler that a lot of people like. Um, there's also an editor called the Komodo editor, which I really like. The thing with all these, though, is these are simple text editors. That is, they may color code things for you, and they may put line numbers in, and they may help make it easier to see things, but you're still typing in the code, the HTML code. You're not simply doing a dragging and dropping like you would, say, in Visual Studio, for those of you that have used that, or like Dreamweaver. You're still, you're still doing it yourself. So they may give you a little bit of a help, but you know, you're still doing that. So you're welcome to use any simple text editor for this. If you're dragging and dropping, though, I'm going to know. Because dragging and dropping using Dreamweaver or Visual Studio doesn't make necessarily good code. It makes code in a very brute force way and it's not the best code, it's not the most maintainable code. All right, so I'm going to put in my doc type. I'm going to put in my HTML tag. Put in my head and body. Yes. Yeah, I, I, yeah, that's a good idea. The question was, as I put, um, I showed uh, an example um, a few classes back of a couple pieces of code that you can put in for uh, to help older browsers like Firefox and older versions of Internet Explorer handle um, HTML5. And, and yeah, that would be a good idea to put on all your pages. And, you know, in the interest of time here, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to put it on these, but I probably should. All right. That does bring up an important point. As you're going through this process, what you don't want to do is wait until you're all done and then test on a different browser. You're going to be testing on a different browser throughout the process. That way you can catch problems as soon as they occur. All right, so I'm going to go and I'm going to put my main sections of the page on here. By my header. Remember I said I'd use an a section for the content area. I 
I then have a nav. And then finally I have a footer. Now, for the most part, if we think about our principles of consistent design and all those things that we talked about, this header is probably going to be the same on every page that I clone from this. This navigation is probably going to be the same. And the footer is, finally going, to, uh, is going to be the same. The only stuff that's going to be different is the stuff that's in the section tag. All right? So, I'm just going to put some placeholder text. And I think we talked about this earlier in the term. There's something for a placeholder text called Greek text that you can generate a paragraph of it. And you can copy and paste it there. This is something that, you know, graphic designers have done for ages. Because if you're working on just the, the layout and the appearance of something, you might not have the actual content right off the bat. So you're just going to use this little dummy placeholder text. That's okay during designing. That's something you definitely don't want to leave when you, when you get to the finished product. What kind of things do you expect I would put in the header here? Let's say I run a photography company. What would, what would be a good idea to put in the header here then? What content and maybe what tags would you use for it? Okay, a logo. All right. Um, I'm going to pretend that I did this picture and use it for my logo. I'm going to turn my file extensions on so I can see the full name of this. It's called jellyfish.jpg. And I'm actually going to edit it. I have a copy of it, right? So I'm okay with uh, editing this. I'm going to open it with our friend Paint. And wow. After oh, okay, right, right, right. There we go. Resize and skew. Let's make this um thirty percent. That's still a little big. Let's go and make it a little smaller. All right. And I might, we'll, we'll pretend that's a good size for the logo. Okay. And then I'm going to save it as logo.jpg. And I'll delete the original because I have that copy elsewhere. All right. So I'm going to put an image in here.
I'm very likely to use some of the header tags or heading tags, an H1. Maybe an H2. And there's my heading. Yeah. Oh, that is a perfect question. The question is, is, is let's go and look at, at, at how this is going to look right now. Because it's really not going to look that good. All right. It's not going to look like Cleveland States or L LCs or whatever. So I'm going to go and save this. One of my students mentioned that the, the book talks about you should save it as UTF-8 um, when you save uh, the HTML document instead of ANSI. And that's a true statement. Um, I just didn't, you know, for what we were doing at the time, that didn't really make a big difference. But as we progress, it's probably a good idea. So I'm going to call this template.html. And I'm going to save it. And as predicted, if I look at it, it doesn't really look like a banner, right? I would want, as he said, I would want this stuff to be like right here alongside of it. And that would be a good banner, all right? So how do we do that? Well, there's a lot of ways that we can do that, all right? We are... How do I want to say this? We're not concerned about that at this point because we're developing simply the common content in the HTML code. This is a CSS question. And one of the, how do I want to say, one of the best, I don't say one of the best skills, but a fundamental skill that you need to develop is when you think about, I want to do this, decide, is this an HTML question or a CSS question? So content is HTML. So if my question was, I want to get rid of, or I want to add another line underneath that, that said, you know, Lorain County, Ohio, USA, where would I put it? Well, that's extra content. So it would be in the HTML. If I said, however, gee, this doesn't really look like a banner. I want this stuff up there. That's not changing the content. That's just changing the way it looks. And that kind of stuff is going to be in the CSS. So right now, we're developing a page that looks like the pages you did the first day of class. All right? And then we're going to style it to get it to look the way that we want it to. All right? So we'll hold off on that thought for a minute here. All right? Or a few minutes. Or actually till next week. <laughs> because I'm looking at the clock and we're out of time. My goal when I am done with this is to have the common content defined. So, and, and be pretty sure I have the common content defined. So, yeah, that's probably what I want in my banner. If I have any decisions to make, I'm going to make them now. You know, maybe I'll show the person once I've gotten it styled a little bit. All right. I'm going to do the same thing for the nav and the footer, um, but that will wait till next week. All right, so we'll pick up with this next week and finish this template and then start styling the template. And that's where the real fun starts. All right, that's where we can make it look however we want to and have it make it match our wireframe. All right, see you up in lab. <laughs>